So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is BizHack Live. It is a webinar series hosted by BizHack Academy. Uh, we do digital marketing training for small businesses and franchisees. And uh, I'm very excited to say that today is actually our 10th uh, weekly um, COVID-19 inspired webinar. Um, you know, one thing, uh, and hopefully she'll be joining us uh, today, uh, we have had uh, one participant who's joined us for every session. Uh, her name is Adriana Shaked, and she is the daughter of the founder of uh, a chocolate factory called Chocolade, um, which was founded more than, um, I guess, gosh, uh, 25 years ago. Uh, there's one in Las Olas in Fort Lauderdale, and they uh, have franchises in different locations. And um, just wanted to say thank you to her uh, for her uh, loyalty and for coming. And it's really exciting uh, to have um, you know small businesses uh, and and even businesses that are growing and and have many locations uh, get something out of these sessions. It's been uh, you know our joy and privilege to. To, uh, to offer these. Uh, Joy is mentioning that there's one in Knoxville, Tennessee, where she's from. And, and for any of you who've ever gone to the shop uh, in Las Olas, it's just delicious. So thank you. Uh, one of the reasons she came to our attention is she always registers. Uh, ah, there you are. Uh, we're giving you a shout out, Adriana. I'm going to unmute you. I'm so glad you were able to join us. You're our 10th this is your 10th session with us, 10 out of 10, and I just wanted to welcome you. Can you say hi? Hi, thank you so much. We love you. We love oh, you for thank coming. You. <laughs> thank you so much. It's very interesting. Well, it's amazing the consistency you've had. You're our best uh, participant by far. How, um, how have you, what have you been getting out of these sessions and what makes you keep coming back for more? Because they always have something that I can use. There's always some tip that I can use. Also, so it gives me the, the, I mean, the idea that I have to continue looking for things in order to try to de develop new marketing ideas and trying to overcome the crisis. Can you give an example of something that, an idea perhaps that came mm -hmm. out of one of the sessions that you've been able to implement? in your location? I, I, it doesn't come out. No, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a question out of the blue. I, I'm not able at this moment to answer. I will think about it and I will let you know. OK, maybe we'll come back to you a little later if that's OK. I know I'm kind of surprising you with this. I, I didn't tell her we were going to do this. One, no, one other thing I, I wanted to say is you, you have an amazing story your, I think it was your father who started the company. He's from Argentina and learned chocolatiering from there. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about your <laughs> locations? We know you have locations in Tennessee and on Las Olas and in other places. And, and tell us also a little bit about how the business is going. Okay. Um, the, in reality, my father used to have a very big chocolate factory. He had the largest candy factory in Argentina and for more than 50 years. And we decided, my husband and I with the kids decided to come to the United States. And we started, of course, the same type of business that we had been all our lives. And um, first, my husband used to be in North Miami Beach with a partner. He, uh, the partner bought him out and my husband started with my son a franchise, which is the Chocolate, Chocolate Chocolate Factory, which is all over the United States. So uh, we have all over stores and this one, the one where I am, which is on 17 in Cordova in Fort Lauderdale is a, uh, it's a franchise uh, owned uh, franchise. So it's owned by the headquarters. And so I am managing it. And uh, this is more or less the story. My husband and my son, you can see the picture. It's, it was 20 something years ago. 
when they started the franchise business in was the chocolate 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 factory well thank you so much for sharing um we're all hungry for chocolate and also to support you um, i see on your website that you can shop online and get free curbside pickup um yes. what is what is the the prognosis in terms of potentially reopening for retail customers? Where, where are you guys at right now? Okay, we are at this moment at 17 in Cordova, in Fort Lauderdale, we are open to the public. So they come slowly, little by little, with the mask, with, the, with gloves, and we take care of them and they can buy chocolate, ice cream and coffee. And uh, so they come, or they can be outside, and we bring the chocolates for them so they can take it home to their car. So it's curbside. Perfect. And how many franchises do you have? It's, uh, I don't know uh, at this moment, because uh, many of them uh, have already uh, decided to to start a, a new business or do something else and uh, some of them are doing very well even with this situation so it depends it's a, it's a little bit in flux how many are owned by headquarters i know the one location are there any others no no the only what they have in orlando which are the headquarters is the chocolate kingdom the Chocolate Kingdom is a place where people come and learn about chocolate. It's, they have tours at, at every hour and they learn about chocolate, they taste chocolate, and they see with their own eyes what how chocolate is made. And there's a nice story about it. You know, this is, you know, thank, thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you for sharing the last 10 Wednesdays with us. I'm so grateful to you and I'm glad that this has been useful to you in some way. Um, and uh, this is actually a perfect, so, so thank you so much, Adriana. I really appreciate you. I thank you very much. And, and best of luck with reopening and everybody who lives anywhere near 17th in Cordoba and Fort Lauderdale, uh, let's, let's show our support and and buy some chocolate and, and coffee and ice cream. Um, <laughs> good luck. Thank you so um, much. Appreciate yeah, and, and we'll check in with you again later. Um, uh, maybe you could let us know if there's anything that comes to you about some of the marketing tips that you've received that you found useful, but we'd be happy to hear from you if, if you come uh, have some thoughts about that. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, this is a perfect kind of segue, frankly, to what we're gonna be talking today. Um, Obviously, um, you know, Adriana is part of the BizHack community, um, a community that we're building week by week with these webinars and with our courses. And uh, if there's anyone in South Florida who's more expert in building community, um, it's uh, Shana Ostrovitz. And so we're gonna be talking about the power and potential of uh, building community for your business. Next week, uh, we're gonna be doing one of the hottest new uh, advertising form formats, Instagram story ads. A lot of people are interested in trying to leverage Instagram stories, not just for organic content, uh, but also to reach new audiences through advertisement. And uh, Giovanni Insignaris of the Related Group is going to be leading that session. He's also a certified BizHack master instructor. Uh, he's run uh, four or five of our 12-week accelerated programs um, and he is a uh, fabulous instructor. I think you're gonna have a great time. This will be a very kind of hands-on and technical session. The week after that, I'm gonna do my own uh, favorite uh, master class. Uh, I realized in the 11 sessions, I wouldn't have actually presented myself. So I wanted to take a minute and, and share some of my own knowledge and expertise. Uh, what I think is the mo single most important topic uh, in digital marketing is audience identification. If you can find your target audience, whether it's on Facebook or Google uh, or any other platform you're on, it is a superpower when it comes to growing your business. So how to, there are some very powerful free tools as well as some really uh, powerful concepts that we teach in our academy. Uh, this is normally a session that we charge for, but 
you know, in the spirit of giving back and building community, we're going to be doing this one for free. Uh, so join us in two weeks for that. And then in three weeks, uh, many of us are wondering where to pivot. And Jennifer Hudson, a corporate communication strategist, uh, has really good advice, uh, which is how to, uh, which is to start with your core values. And once you've identified your core values as an entrepreneur and the core values of your business, the question of where to pivot becomes much more manageable and much easier. It's not simply about opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity out there. It's how to pick among various options. And the answer is start by looking internally and understanding your values. So those are our next three sessions after today. But um, many of you know me, I'm Dan Gretsch, the founder of BizHack, former journalist turned marketer turned educator. Um, I am uh, also someone who um, is very proud to be running a business with uh, our tribe, our community of biz hackers. And I consider everybody who's on today's uh, call, uh, webinar, as well as everyone who has graduated from our accelerated program in digital marketing for small businesses to be part of our community. Uh, we call them the biz hackers. So you are all biz hackers by virtue of being here today. And we do have a private Facebook group uh, where the alumni uh, businesses of our program meet and interact and uh, continue to grow and thrive together. Um, if you're interested in becoming part of the BizHack uh, private community, um, we have a five-week accelerated course that we offer. And by virtue of taking that, you then become part of that marketing group. Um, and uh, our next one is starting a little bit over a month from now. If you're interested in learning more, you can uh, check out our syllabus at try.bizhack.com slash syllabus. And if you're interested in having an application interview with me to figure out if the course is a fit for you, just go to apply.bizhack.com. So with that, I wanted to introduce our featured guest for today, uh, Shana Ostrovitz. Um, Shana is going to be talking about how to offer a solution to that problem that is bigger than any product or service. So obviously, uh, every business is out to solve a problem, but the solution has to be bigger than your product or service, or you're not going to have true longevity, according to Shana. We're going to talk about how to identify the problem your customer is dealing with now uh, and reassess that over time to make sure your business stays relevant. That advice is never more relevant than during the changed environment in which we all live now. And then how to build a community of loyal customers who will stick with you over time and through changing situations. Shana's superpower is building communities to empower businesses. She does that, uh, she's done that in various ways throughout her career. Currently she's doing that as the executive director of 1909, which is a Palm Beach County nonprofit that is dedicated to accelerating entrepreneurs. They have a co-working space. They offer mentorship and education. I've been a guest speaker at a 1909 um, educational program. She's also the co-founder of Rooster Local, which is a company that is dedicated to helping service entrepreneurs grow their businesses. You're gonna hear a lot of lessons that she got from building Rooster Local, uh, as well as uh, running 1909. She's worked in corporate settings at Procter & Gamble, GE, the American Diabetes Association, and Bacchus Global. And she has this one line in her bio that really stood out to me. Uh, and I thought it was a beautiful expression of who she is as a professional and her core values. While well, Shana has always been passionate about the marketing side of the business, creatively, she felt that there was still something missing, that missing piece, her desire to enrich her community and empower others. And uh, today's session and her work at 1909 and at Rooster Local were all about empowering other small businesses. Uh, and so that with that, I wanna welcome Shana. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much for having me, Dan, and for that lovely introduction. I am so excited to be here um, and to be a speaker as part of this Biggest Hack series. 
Um, and I could listen to Adriana speak all day about chocolate. So hopefully that becomes um, one of the events that I can chime into in the future and listen in. Um, but so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so I can get started. Give me one second. See my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so as Dan mentioned, today we're talking about the power of community, which is one of my favorite um, things to talk about and speak about. And one of the things that I always find interesting is that the word community means something different to different people. And there's a different, it resonates differently with people. Some people feel very connected to the word community. Other people feel like it's a little fluffy. Um, to me, it's always been something that I have either unintentionally or intentionally been a builder of and a believer in um, through all, all, all of my journey. And essentially what I mean by community is the people around you, whether it's customers, mentors, your team, whoever it is that supports you um, along your journey in life, but especially as an entrepreneur. And for those of us who are business owners, um, entrepreneurship can be very lonely. It is a daunting task. It takes a lot of creativity. It takes a lot of hard work. Uh, takes a lot of uphill climbing and um, doing it alone is one of the hardest ways you can do it. So it's hard anyways. Um, and my philosophy is that having a community around you and a support system around you uh, makes that journey a little bit easier, a little bit more fun and usually more successful. So talking about how to build that, I'm going to dive right in. Let's see how I can get this slide. So um, Dan gave me a nice introduction, but just kind of want to tell you a little bit about why I'm here speaking with you and um, talking about community. So as he mentioned, I have a background um, from the Fortune 500 company side and some large brands like Gillette and GE and the American Diabetes Association. And um, some of the biggest takeaways I learned from those big organizations is their processes, especially around market research and learning their customers and understanding what it means to really identify the problems they're solving and speak to it. Um, you know, from the nonprofit world, same thing, you know, really being mission driven. And then as an entrepreneur uh, myself. So about six years ago, as Dan mentioned, I started a company called Rooster, which was here uh, based out of Delray, but covering all of um, Palm Beach County to support solopreneurs in the service industry. And, um, you know, when we went out to do this, we had this big vision of how we were going to help people and everybody needed uh, technology. And that was really our belief as we knew that small business owners uh, needed help and we knew that um, we could do that and that, that we had access to providing people an easier um, way to get to customers and to manage their business. And we really started driving towards technology and building an app and offering a technology solution that we felt would make our customers' lives easier. Um, and we talked to customers, we went out, we talked to them a lot. Um, you know, we asked a lot of questions about the product, what they wanted. Uh, do you want this feature? Do you want that feature? Oh, what if you had this? Wouldn't it be amazing if you could easily take credit card this way? And of course we got all this feedback through that type of questioning that we wanted which essentially made us feel that we were uh, had the golden ticket, right? That this technology solution that we were building, this product was gonna change the world and it was gonna be the end all be all. Um, and at the same time, through building this technology and launching this business, one of my goals was to do the marketing and build a business side around that. So one of the plans around that was to start offering events and programming and really work with the business owners that we were working on um, really transitioning onto our technology on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And it was a very interesting experience. And one of the things that we started to learn over time and over time was people wanted to pay with us. They wanted to work with us. They wanted to learn from us and they did not care about our technology. They wanted community and they wanted connection and they wanted our educational se sessions and they wanted to meet with one another and everything we said that we wanted to do to help them they wanted but they just wanted it in a different way and it was really hard for us actually to accept and acknowledge that and to say we were so focused on one way to solve this problem and we spent a lot of money on it and we fundraised and we built 
an actually incredible technology tool that we actually were able to sell and, you know, somebody else can use. So I'm proud of that still, but it didn't, it wasn't what the customer wanted. It wasn't actually solving the problem in a way that the community that we were looking at and trying to help wanted our help. And can I, can I dig in with that, with you on sure. that? Sure. Yeah. Um, I can imagine the tortured conversations between you and your co-founders as Totally. This was dawning on you. Can you put us into that boardroom, <laughs> that midnight conversation, that, you know, that fight, whatever it was, could you just tell us like anecdotally how this dawned on you and your team? It probably the realization came and because you were so in touch with the customer, it probably came to you first. How you, how you had that aha moment and realized that the technology was almost secondary. I, I'd love to just dig into that moment for a second with you. Yeah, you know, it was, I wouldn't say it was like a moment. It was definitely an overtime realization. And I think it was something we were, to be honest, resistant to. And even me, you know, who was on the front lines talking to people every day, because, you know, again, we had spent so much time and energy and money building something that we thought could work. And it's hard sometimes to step away from that and to say, maybe that's not right. And so, what we really started seeing and what um, I started noticing was that we had a lot of engagement in the other things that we were doing. There were certain things that we got a ton of engagement on. They were very easy. They were great lead generators. So anytime people engaged with some of those events or some of those activities or as guests, they wanted to join, right? They wanted to sign up. They wanted to pay us. So it became very clear, right? When you're selling, strategy becomes easy because you're offering something of value, I think that's when it really dawned on us. We're doing something here that people want and are asking to pay for. And then over here on this side, we're trying to sell something and encourage people to do something that they're not really grabbing onto. Um, and so that for me was really eye-opening. And, and to be honest, yeah, it's tough as a team. And you know, we all didn't get to that place at the same time. Um, of being okay with that and being ready and saying, okay, well, what does that mean for our business? What does that mean for the future? How do we move forward? Um, and ultimately we decided that, you know, we had gone so hard and so full in to one product and one solution with one structure that it really couldn't work under that format um, in the way we had set it up. Unfortunately, because the business was so focused on such a singular offering um, in the way that it had been structured, that it really only made sense to just do something different, which for me, you know, 1909 is very in line with all of the things I learned and what I'm now able to deliver. It's just a different solution to that, um, that at this time works and will evolve over time to continue to work and, you know, is set up more in a way to adapt and evolve. Yeah. I want to unpack what you just said, because I think what you said is so profound and important. And then I'll give you back the rain. Sure. But first of all, I, you said when the selling strategy becomes easy. And I think so many of us who are business owners, we kind of have come to assume that business is hard, that you're going to grit your teeth and you're going to just make it because you're resilient and you never give up. And I remember Max Borges, who runs the Borges Agency, the Max Borges Agency, said to me that about a couple years into his business, he runs a digital marketing agency, they looked at their client list and they realized that um, there was a set of clients that they loved who couldn't get enough of them, that were easy and fun to work with and who represented, you know, 20% of the work and 80% of the outcomes. And then there was everybody else who were demanding and unhappy and a pain in the butt and it was in that moment, and, and he realized that everybody that he liked working with was in the uh, consumer tech space. They were making gadgets, consumer technology gadgets. And the conventional wisdom at the time was that you were not allowed to work with multiple companies if you're an agency in the same space. So if you have a headphone company, you're not allowed to have another headphone company that you represent simultaneously. And Max, who... Uh, you know, didn't come from digital marketing, didn't even uh, graduate, I believe, from college. He's like, well, why is that the rule? And I don't like that rule. I love working for headphone manufacturers, and there are four of them I want to work with. And as long as I don't, you know, I keep siloed their work, I don't see why we can't do it. 
And so he fired all the rest of his customers and he just focused exclusively on what was easiest and who were his most joyful customers. And he's been eminently more successful, profitable and happy. Um, so I wanted to just share that one story about um, really paying attention when selling becomes easy. Because mm -hmm. I know personally, I think of selling as a grind. And then sometimes just like the sale happens and it's easy to remember, forget those and remember the hard ones. But actually you might be missing a huge strategic opportunity. Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, as entrepreneurs, like we always are in the selling mode and that's just part of it. But I do think, you know, there are moments in time and there are times when you get to a point where you're doing something that is really creating that value, really connecting with people in a stronger way that they're gravitating towards and you'll start to see it. Um, and again, it changes over time and that's really what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. And there's so, one other quick thing I wanted to say, which you figured out what your superpower was through Rooster probably, and then reapplied it in a totally different setting, you know, from a startup technology to a nonprofit, you know, uh, accelerator, they don't sound like they have anything in common. And if you were not more in touch with who you are as a person and as a professional, you might, it might look like a very disjointed career path when in fact, they naturally flow one into the other. So I just wanted to point that out as well. Sometimes it is in, um, you know, a job teaches us a lesson. Mm. And what it teaches us is what our core values are. And so we're going to be talking about this with Jennifer Hudson in a couple of weeks, but you've learned what your superpower is and what your core values are. And then you can apply that in very different settings and very different jobs. And it creates like a through line and a story to your career that uh, is incredibly powerful. Yeah. And, and I think again, as a person, and as we think about that as business owners and trying to create businesses like that, it's really thinking about, you know, our why and, you know, the purpose that we have and the contribution that we want to make and the problem we're solving. Because again, whether the vehicle, the format, the solution will change and evolve over time because people evolve and change over time and situations evolve and change over time. We're in that moment right now uh, where the world has changed and things that worked four months ago don't work anymore. But what people are committed to and what problems people are trying to solve and what they want to bring to the world doesn't have to change um, and probably is more powerful now. So kind of really diving into how to do that uh, is what I'm going to walk us through. And I'm going to call it, you know, we're going to kind of go back to basics. And I'm doing that because I want people, even if you're a business owner already, you have their structure a certain way, you, you know, have an idea of what your product or solution is. It's always really good to just have those moments of evaluation and um, just thought around kind of what you're doing, whether it's a reminder and a refresher or it's a brand new idea, um, it's good to kind of go through this process, which I'm gonna walk us through. So to get us in the right mindset, I wanna do a little exercise, which is walking through a couple business cases um, that I'm gonna talk through about. There's some of my favorite examples of businesses that you have heard of and you know, um, but that have really different backgrounds and came to life in very different ways. So the first one, and you can type in the comments if you know, oh wait, hold on. Here we go. So if you know who this company is, type it in the comments um, and you won't get a prize, but you will be very cool if you get it right. Um, so this business, um, the product they were working on was developed by an inventor and visionary who holds more than a hundred patents. Um, they had significant financing. They actually spent about $100 million developing uh, this revolutionary technology product. Um, before the product was launched, it was predicted to reach a um, billion dollars in sales, which was the fastest in history for a product launch like this. Um, Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos, who most of you probably know who they are, uh, were visionaries in their own right, said this would be revolutionary, um, and they were able to launch the product on Good Morning America. Does anybody know who this is? All right, give us a minute. Um, we need at least five people to type in. Uh, <laughs> if we don't get five, we're not moving on. So go ahead and type your guesses. Give a guess. All right, so we have uh, Andrea. <laughs> 
Davidowitz uh, using a question mark with her guess uh, for segue. Mm -hmm. uh, any others? We're going to just stay here until they do it. They'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have faster typing than others. Right. Hutch, I need to see you in there, buddy. We need you. All right. Who watches Good Morning America regularly and knows what product was launched? They actually launch a lot of products, but um, you got to know somebody to, to get on their show. All right. Hang on. We're going to give them a minute more. I'm, uh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make this painful for them if they don't do it. Here they come. <laughs> Shakira guessed the iPod. Okay. Hutch is stumped. Mm -hmm. Gerardo Reyes said the pet rock. I love that answer. That's four guys. We need one more guess. Lilia, you can jump in. I see Three. Elon Musk. No idea. I see you all. <laughs> Melissa France, I want to hear from you. Marla, Ruth Ann, feel free to jump in. Smartphone. Okay. We got a couple. All right. All Good right. Thank you guys. So the first answer was actually correct. So it was Segway. So Segway is uh, one of my favorite business examples, and they've had several case studies written about them. Um, because Segway was a revolutionary technology. Actually, the technology that was developed for the Segway has been used in many other products that we've seen. Um, and the concept around it has been used and has ended up being very successful for other companies other than Segway, um, because Segway didn't make it. But what happened with Segway was that they built the product in a box on purpose. They didn't want people to know about the technology. They were excited about it. They knew it was re really revolutionary, that they had this team of inventors and money and everything they needed. Essentially, they had everything they needed to have a successful business. The team, the money, the support, the PR and marketing, they had what you think you need to launch a successful product and have a successful company, but they didn't. And what happened is Segway didn't talk to customers. They didn't test their product. They didn't identify a problem they were solving clearly enough to really understand what the solution was supposed to be. So what they did is they launched a product for the mass market that cost about $5,000. Um, it was not mobile, so people had this, but they couldn't take it up and down stairs, right? It's not like a bicycle. Um, they had a lot of issues in cities with whether it could go on the sidewalk or whether it could go on the street or where it was supposed to go because of how fast it went. And there was all this stuff that they didn't get to weed out before they launched it and spent all this money on it because they didn't talk to people. They didn't get feedback. They didn't learn enough about the problem they were solving and how to solve it before they launched it. So unfortunately, um, although they moved technology forward for the rest of us in other products, they were very unsuccessful because of their strategy. And unfortunately, not really understanding the human component of what a business is trying to do, right? Which is trying to solve problems and offer value to people. So there's one of these great case studies about them that wrote that Segway accidentally found a niche of old men who don't mind looking funny in public. That is really like what Segway now is known for um, after all of that, right? Billion dollars in research. So one of my favorites. What not to do. Okay, so now we're going to go on to the next example. Um, again, if you know the answer to this. Uh, I'm ready. Um, what was that? I was telling everybody to get ready, get their fingers. Oh, okay, get ready. Ones. All right, so this business uh, was started to target competitive runners who wanted to get to the Olympics. It was invented by a track coach who deeply understood the needs of his target market. Um, they tested the product prototypes on college athletes before going to major manufacturing. Um, they were actually considered newbies in their industry when they first started. So they were kind of the newbie and small guy on the block. Um, and the founders were actually known for keeping their day job for about the first 10 years uh, that the company started to keep the bills low and to really validate what they were doing and create a successful business. So who knows the answer to this? This is a good one. Let's see, cool towel Fitbit. Who Ooh. else? What is cool towel while their other answers are coming in? Never heard of that one. Yeah. Do you know what that is, Shana? 
I don't. It sounds like a towel, though, that keeps cool around you, which sounds <laughs> awesome. I've seen those. All right, everybody's guessing Fitbit. I hope Bla okay. Blade Runners. Blade Runners. OK. So um, I'm going to surprise you all. This is a company you all know and know very well and is pretty um, iconic. And it's Nike. So everybody thinks of Nike now as this huge company who's in tons of different sports and offers tons of different products. What people forget is how Nike started, which was very, very focused on solving a specific problem, which was the fact that they were working with such elite runners that the difference for these runners was literally five seconds of time. And when you think about that, like what do you need to do to shave five seconds off your time so that you can win a race, get to the Olympics and win a gold medal? That's literally what they were taking on. And they obviously ended up developing the shoe with the waffle bottom, um, which at the time was their solution and really worked through that. But over time, what Nike's really gotten and what we know them as is a brand of champions, right? Nike represents being a champion. So even though I wear it and I'm not, you know, winning Olympics or track races or Michael Jordan, I am buying a brand of champions, right? That's the message around it. It doesn't matter again what sport it is, what the product is. Nike has so many products and not to say their products aren't good. It's important how they develop their products, but what they're doing is they're solving the problem of how do you be the best at what you do and how do you represent that and what products serve that. And that's what they're constantly focusing on. So everything that's coming out is saying, how do we support champions? And it's a totally different mindset, right? From saying, this is a product, this is what it's gonna do, the product's amazing, versus we are gonna support champions. We wanna support people at the highest level of what they do to achieve what they do. And the thing that's interesting about Nike too is that records are broken every year, right? So they just broke the two hour marathon and the guy was wearing Nikes that are very different from the first Nikes that were worn by Steve Prefontaine. Totally different product, but same promise. They have the same promise now as they did then, which is that you are going to win if you wear Nikes. And that's what people want, right? They wanna be winners, they don't care about the shoe. So just to get our minds in that space, right, of what that difference really looks like of being a segue and having that outcome and being a Nike and having their outcome, and what that really means for your business and how do you do that? So kind of breaking it down again, how do, you, how do you do this for yourself? So the first step in that is really, again, identifying, well, what's the problem you're solving? And first saying to yourself, how do you know that problem's valid? A lot of times we make assumptions that our problem is everybody else's problem or that people see the problem the same way, but how do we really make sure that that problem's valid? Who are all the people that have that problem? and identifying those groups. And then who is the most impacted or motivated by that problem? And that bottom question is really important because those are your early adopters, those are your loyal people, those are the ones that are willing to test your product, service, solution, whatever you have because they believe in what you're doing, right? Those are the runners that put on shoes that were developed in a garage and ran a um, college championship in them. That's a big deal, right? It's a big deal to take that risk and test something new but when you know the people that are most impacted that have the most to gain from what you're doing it's really identifying those people and again nike we're going to continue the example was runners who need to shave five seconds off their time which is a very small group of people at a very elite level who were these right the people that were most impacted that cared the most to be invested in what nike was creating so really thinking about how do you identify those people? And I'm gonna give you two some tips as we go on how to really answer these questions. So just kind of going through the thought process. So in the second question you wanna ask is what alternatives are being used to solve the problem, right? So what are people using now or instead of to solve the problem? And what are the strengths and weaknesses of these alternatives? And again, these are really important questions to ask because they help you identify where you're unique. So there's probably somebody doing what you do, right? That's normal, that's what we have in the world. There's lots of people trying to solve problems, which is not a bad thing. What we want is to identify where are we unique? Where are we offering something that nobody's offered before in a different way or that supports people in a different way? So again, and again, I'm just gonna keep the thread of Nike. So what 
who, what were the alternatives? So what people were running in were shoes that were built for non-runners. So up until that point, there were sneakers and shoes that were essentially adapted for runners, but they were not shoes built for runners and they were not built for the different surfaces that the runners were running on, which is again why that waffle sole became so important and was such a big piece of their communication to the world about being um, a brand for runners was because they were looking at what were runners up against while they were running on different surfaces and they needed their shoes to be able to adapt. Right? So they solved for that. And again, this is where you really identify where are you unique and what can you do different to solve the problem? And then saying, well, what benefit do I offer? Which then is going to lead you to the solution, right? Before you even have the solution, what benefit do you offer? So what benefit does the customer really want? So again, in the Nike case, they want to win, right? They want to be the champion. They want to be winning races and breaking world records. And Again, it's not about the shoes, it was about winning. So, right, that was the idea. You wanna be a champion, that's the benefit we offer. We support champions. And then the first solution to that was the shoes with the waffle soles, which as I mentioned before, have been adapted over the years. So really cluing into that, what is the benefit? People don't want shoes. Yes, sure, they want shoes, they need to wear shoes, but they wanna win. That was genius, that understanding and mentality. And if you can get that about what the people who you're trying to help really want, at a much higher level, right? Do people want to go to a gym? No, people want to be fit. They want to be healthy, right? They see working out and going as, and to a gym as the solution to that. But really understanding that value is the most important piece. So, you know, again, the big takeaway from this is connecting with your customers, right? Really trying to understand what their needs are, what their problems are, ask questions, and get to know their lives. And I always like um, how to's for me, it's great to know well, how do I actually apply this in my own life and really get these things. So I'm kind of gonna walk you through an exercise, pretty well known um, in the accelerator world and the lean startup model world. Um, usually, you know, startups and businesses that are going through these really intensive programs are asked to do this because it's so valuable. The impact of this exercise on your business is unbelievable. Like I promise you, if you do it, you are going to appreciate it and you're gonna get a lot out of it. So it's called the 100 customer interview exercise. And the idea is to talk to 100 customers and interview them. But the trick is you're not gonna to talk to them about your product or solution, okay? So what you're gonna do, and this is, right, visualize this, you're gonna take your product or solution you think you have, you're gonna put it in a box and you're gonna put the box under the bed. And then you're gonna go talk to people and you're gonna ask them about themselves, right? About their days, what are they doing? What are their lives like? How are they solving the problem you think they have? What problems are coming up? Um, what challenges are in their way of accomplishing the things that they wanna accomplish? Um, you know, again, let's go back to the gym example. What is their schedule like? What is their work like life? How do they, what is the transportation that they have to and from if they're going to a gym or trying to do that? right? Maybe they have a kid's schedule or a, a work schedule that they're dealing with. Really understanding what does it look like? What does their world look like? So I identify the problems that, right, are really there and validating that. And you should go in with a hypothesis, right? So a lot of times you go, you go into, it's like, you know, the um, scientific method, right? You want to go into these questions with a hypothesis of, I believe this is the problem. And your goal is to validate that. So again, really asking questions, not in do you have this problem, but what's going on and trying to validate it like you're doing a science experiment. <laughs> Think about it like that. That's really how you're gonna get to the core of it. So again, asking real questions about people's lives. And then once you identify that, and you've said, hey, I validated my hypothesis that people, people wanted um, to be able to work out 24 hours a day and they want um, a gym that's available that offers X, Y, and Z to do that, right? You're gonna, that's the solving for that problem. So you've validated it, you've understood their issues, and then you solve for it. And the thing about solving for the value is that customers will tell you, right? As I mentioned before, they're either gonna buy into it and they're gonna love you or they're gonna tell you and they're gonna give you feedback and they're gonna help direct you to solve the problem. And if you let them know, that your goal is to solve that problem and you want to help them achieve X, right? You want to help them be a champion, break world record, get into the Olympics, that they'll help you do that. And they'll help direct you to that answer and that solution because they believe in it and they want it too, 
right? If I want to be a champion and break a world record and somebody tells me they're here to help me do that, I'm going to interact with them and give them the feedback they need and support they need to make it happen. So really adding value to people's lives, always being the mindset of adding value, right? What people need change over time. So if you're thinking about adding that value and solving those problems, you're always going to be in the right mindset. But if you're thinking, this is what I do, like I offer gym classes or I offer sneakers, your mind's just not going to be in the right place to be able to adapt and serve people and add value when things change, right? We've seen this so clearly over the past couple months in how things change. And people, right, they were solving problems certain ways, and now those ways are not even options. <laughs> so now, right, again, if you went to a gym before, now what do you need to do to be healthy, to be fit, um, to stay in shape, to feel good about yourself? It might, it's a totally different solution. And needs to be provided in a different way, you know, with different support. So just really being in that mindset, it's like the North Star. Keeping your North Star always there, always reminding and letting it guide you to the solutions and products that you offer. And that's really what's going to build loyalty. Because if people believe that and they know that's what you stand for, they're going to come with you through the different iterations of what you do. And that really gets me in to the next point, which is communicate the bigger picture, right? Make sure people know what you're solving, what you're up to. What is this big vision that you have? What are your values and your mission and the big picture you're trying to accomplish? Again, if Nike says, hey, we're going we're gonna to be champions. They literally, they went to Steve Prefontaine and they said, we're going to help you get to the Olympics. Like, let's do it together. And that was their company's goal. And they worked collectively to accomplish that. And you we'll see that customers will feel ownership when you let them be a part of that. When you let them be a part of that big vision that you're trying to accomplish and they feel that they're on that journey with you, right? Like when we had to shut down our spaces, our members, you know, they got it. They were like, hey, we want to be on the other side of this. Like we want 1909 to exist. We all want to come back together and be in the space and hug it out and, and have a celebration. And if we all want that to happen, like we're in it together because we believe it's better for all of us at the end of the day. And we adapted for that. And, you know, it's really important. And, you know, most people have heard the Simon Sinek quote, but it's so true. You know, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And you have to tell people why. You have to remind people why. You have to enroll people in the why so that they get it and they can be a part of it, right? Everybody wants to be a part of that journey to be champions. You may not get it right away. There may be iterations of it, but people are gonna be on board for that and stick with you over time. And then this is a little bonus concept that um, I've felt is really important because you know we've talked a lot about customers today and building that community. But for me, I think community is much bigger um, and I've seen that in my own experience is that there's multiple sides the community that surrounds you and uh, focusing on the community that supports you and is on the other side uplifting you is incredibly important as you take on supporting other people and offering value and solving problems for other people um, it's great to have a community with you so um, some you know community uh, you know attributes that I consider mentors so you know if you don't have mentors, maybe you have unofficial mentors, official mentors, you know, Dan and I have both been part of a program called BMT, the Venture Mentoring Team, um, which is incredible, um, you know, or having advisors and a board, you know, people who essentially work for your company without a staff title, who are there to help get things done and make decisions and help move the mission of the organization forward. Um, having that's incredibly important and supportive partnerships. So, you know, again, building partnerships with other businesses or people, um, to help move your business forward, to help share in visions that are maybe similar, right? If you have synergy with somebody else to look for that and say, you know, Hey, we're all trying to make a contribution here. Can we do that collectively and support one another? Um, and then looking at support organizations, you know, what resources are out there to support you, you know, whether it's BizHack doing events like this and training, you know, 1909, again, the venture mentoring team, there's actually tons of organizations that exist to support business owners in different ways and everyone kind of plays their own role. So really taking advantage of that and saying, who do I need on my team? 
right? How do I build my capacity? Because most of us as small business owners have limited staff, <laughs> right? Like there's limited staff, there's limited resources. So how do you build your capacity? And these are great ways to do that without having to spend money often or spend little money um, to get huge results and get huge value. Um, so I highly recommend looking into, you know, building the community support system that you have for yourself so that then you can deliver on all of those things for your customers, solve that problem, offer that value at a really high level. And that's my presentation. So this is a cute little picture of our community at one of our calls, all cheersing. Um, we have about 200 members and um, we just, you know, love being there for each other. They're all entrepreneurs, business owners, business leaders. And, um, you know, this picture makes me smile because that's what it's all about. As I said in the beginning, it's all about people. I think people are the biggest um, element and support system we can have in our personal and business lives. So I, I will open it up for questions if you all have any. Perfect. Um, Samuel was asking what organization is that? Uh, I think it's your 1909 community, right? Your co-working space. And yep, this is 1909, and that was a call we did with the uh, West Palm Beach Downtown Development Authority. Um, we did a training. I don't remember which one that was, but yeah, it was a Zoom lunch. Um, you know, I, I wanted to make sure to, to circle back to Adriana, whom we started with, um, and to ask her, uh, what she got out of today's presentation and how um, the, the conversation that we had can be applied to businesses different uh, as a chocolate company. Um, so uh, Adriana, I'm going to take you off mute um, and uh, welcome back. Thank you for uh, being here for our 10th webinar. <laughs> Thank you so much. I thought that I was going to be talking about what we talked before in those 10 uh, sessions. Did yeah. What, yeah. What, what, what did you get out of, uh, what was like one example of something you got out of one of our sessions that. Okay. You... I have a, a few, for instance, in your session, when you talked about digital marketing resources for small businesses and you gave a list of different resources. So I even mentioned one of them LinkedIn with the 16 LinkedIn learning courses for free. I mentioned that in my, in my LinkedIn uh, um, post and uh, people were very happy to hear about that. So that was one. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you beautifully. You okay. know, I'm gonna actually, but before you go through your list, I, I don't wanna lose the thread about community, but we'll, we'll come back to you in a few minutes so that okay. you can wrap up this session, but because um, I don't want to lose the, um, the thread there, but I'll be back with you, okay, in a few minutes? Okay. Perfect. Um, you know, one of my favorite community builders in the world is Florencia Jimenez Marcos. Flo, Flo are, you, are you on? Are you uh, able to unmute yourself? She might have actually just left. She, was, she does such a beautiful job of creating community. Uh, another great community builder is Jerome Hutchinson, Hutch. Um, Hutch, I see that you're off mute. You want to reflect a little bit on some of the uh, ideas and, and lessons uh, that um, were shared today by Shana? Sure. Uh, first of all, great job. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And I'm a big Simon Sinek fan as well. And uh, so yeah. I really enjoyed it. I uh, wanted to ask a question and I'll, and I'll make a comment first based off what, what Dan was just, just saying. And I think, you know, what you said was, and, and keeping in mind why you're doing it, but also why people are doing business with you. You know, not just what they did. You know, yeah, they came to the store and bought something, but why did they buy it? And what is it that they're looking for? What's the pain? What's the objective? Uh, that's, such, that's so powerful, you know, and all too often, you know, we pay more attention to what happens versus why it happened. And when you really understand the why, you can duplicate it, you can replicate it, you can do a lot of different things. But if you don't, then, you know, you really have a tough time and you try to do something similar, you wonder why it didn't work. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and that's the reason you didn't really understand the why. So I thought that was the most powerful piece, you know, that really came out of it. And I also love the way that you mentioned how, 
you started out, and, I, and I, make sure I heard you right. I guess at one point you were going to do a more of a virtual community, but you found that they really wanted to be in person. Is that what happened? Um, no, it was actually more of a tool that we made a technology tool for them to manage their business. And community was kind of the element to help market that, that ended up being the product they really wanted. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. All right. That was what I was a little unclear about, but I'm glad you put it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Shana, just to dig in on that for a second, do you think that there was a, if community is what they wanted, was there a product or service that you could develop that actually was a, a successful business? In other words, it, you know, was there a business in what they wanted? Yes. And I think that that, I'm actually working on developing that now. So yes, um, absolutely. And again, that's part of it too, is knowing that there's, there's different paths, right? And again, there's different solutions and, and testing that and learning from people um, and the why, you know, exactly that point they're looking for that is really helpful. Um, and I know that in a different capacity now. So there absolutely is a business there. You know, Marla uh, Oxenhandler asked, how do you think a sense of community will change during this virus challenge? Um, I think it's going to uh, strengthen tremendously in certain ways. So I think people um, now have, have a sense of maybe certain things that they took for granted before um, that were available to them, uh, people support, you know, things that um, felt like we're just there all the time that now maybe people have to work a little harder to access. And I personally think that community is um, going to be stronger than ever in different ways. I think people will probably continue to be a little hesitant of, you know, large gatherings and things like that. But I think people want to be together. They want to support one another. People get the communities that they live in that, um, you know, 80% of them are driven by small business owners need help and they want those businesses to survive they want to go to the chocolate shops they want to go to the restaurants they want to go to the coffee shops and the retail shops and i think people get that and i think because of that they're realizing how important it is that within our communities we look and see how we can contribute and work together to you know really support each other during this time and come out the other side hopefully stronger you know, one of the things that Walmart showed is that people really like low prices. One of the things that Amazon is showing is that people really love convenience. If you're a small business, you have no chance of competing on low prices or convenience. So what else do you have that can differentiate you? You, your why, your passion, your vision, you know, and, 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 and that's why learning how to express your why and articulate your vision mission values is actually the only path forward for you because if you don't do that and you're just a useful product you're putting yourself at tremendous risk of getting copied by a, a big uh a, a deep pocketed uh competitor and one thing i'll say about small business is a lot of us have a big reservoir for desire for small business in our life because so much of the joy that we get as a consumer comes from going to that amazing restaurant or that incredible chocolate shop. And, you know, even if it's a franchise, it's still a small business, but that reservoir of good, um, of, of good faith and, and desire is not endless. And what I'm seeing right now in the small businesses in my life is some are doing a fabulous job of staying in touch and others are doing a terrible job of staying in touch. And I worry for those ones that are doing a terrible job because I want them to survive too, but I can feel my bond to them weakening. And that's what you need to be worried about right now is if you're not communicating actively and providing value and solving problems in whatever way you can in this moment, the bond of loyalty and the desire to see you succeed is just, it's slowly weakening and suddenly, ah, the cheaper price or the greater convenience will win out. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that people wanna hear from you, they wanna know what you're doing, even if you're not open, you yeah. know, knowing, um, reminding them of that story and your why and that connection is huge. 
um, because people will remember. Um, Melissa France, are you able to take yourself off mute? I know you've been at a bunch of our sessions and you're, you're someone who's been amazing at building community throughout your career. I just wanted to hear your reflections on, on what you heard today as an as a entrepreneur and as a professional. Oh my goodness, thank you. <laughs> um, I never thought of myself in that way, but um, I thought it was excellent. I've been diligently taking notes over here because I am getting ready to start a new, uh, really ex taking what I've been doing to the next level and I'll be launching within the next week or so. And where I've been out of touch a little bit with the community that I have created, which is a small business vendor artisanal community, just so you know. Um, and the name of my company is eventvillage.world. Um, I'm, I'm taking problems that I saw through my experiences and now translating it into trying to improve certain roadblocks that were there and certain difficulties and struggles and time consuming things that were happening. And then all of a sudden Corona and I had to pivot again, which I am doing. And, but at the same time, um, I'm passionate about what I'm doing and I'm very focused on my why because, you know, as you said, Dan and uh, Shana, that's what's going to make me different from Amazon and even Facebook now is getting in the game. So, um, you know, no, I, I was particularly interested in uh, this, this uh, little webinar that you were doing today because of the, the importance of building community and engaging people. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's great Thank to you. see you here. Um, <laughs> One other person I wanted to ask, uh, Shakira Johnson. Shakira, are you able to to say a thing? Because I know you're building uh, a community in the work that you do as well. Um, let me see if I can. Hi, Dan. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. So tell me how today's session landed for you um, in terms of building community and what you're trying to do with your lifestyle brand. So it landed in two ways. One, the segue example was um, frustrating. Yeah. And it was frustrating because they had it all. They had it all um, and, and, and dropped the ball. Um, so that was frustrating. And just to think about um, the privilege and the opportunity and to still miss the mark. Um, because there's a lot of great brands and a lot of great teams that don't have all that. Um, so that, that came, that was, a, there was a little frustration, a little sour patch with that story. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the positives and, and community building, really thinking about what problem do you solve for them? Um, and that a lot can just come from listening. Um, so for um, my brand, OMG, I didn't even know. So Hutch made a point about sometimes you're doing things that are good and you don't even know what it is. Um, so we didn't really understand what value we were adding, but we, we came to find out we were bringing confidence to people and self-esteem to people, um, to women specifically, women and their children, women and their daughters even more specifically. Um, so through listening, we were able to find that out and then double down on that. So um, that's another piece is just the listening to what um, your either would be customers or community base or your current community base is saying and then to take that and double down on it so that you can really see what their problem is. Um, and what value you're really adding to them so then you can increase that. So those are my takeaways. But the segue one is just blasphemous. Like, <laughs> almost like... <laughs> it is frustrating. <laughs> I know. That's why it's such a powerful example, though. Yeah. It's just, like, wrong. I know. Uh, but it's good, to, it's good to share. It's good to share. Mm -hmm. Um, well, Shana, I'll give you the last word before we bring it back to Adriana and wrap up. Um, any, anything, any final thoughts you had about uh, that you wanted to share? 
I just wanted to say that I just love what was just shared about confidence. You know, that's the, that was kind of the point I was trying to create is right. Confidence is so much bigger than clothing or whatever else that is that exists. And that's powerful. That's what people want. And, you know, desire that changes people's lives, right? When you give them confidence, that's so incredible to know that you can deliver that for somebody else on the other side and how powerful that is for them in their life. And that's, I think, what it's all about, right? What contribution can we make for other people? Um, and then what different ways can we do that? What different ways can we make those contributions and being creative around it and being adaptable? Um, and so I love it. I think that was a perfect ending, actually. I, I'm going to leave it at that because that sounds great. Yeah. And I want to build on that because, you know, one of the things I realized that, you know, BizHack's ostensible product is uh, training and information, but what I realized what we're actually providing is confidence that yes, you can do this, this thing that you've tried to do and got frustrated by this thing you've hired others to do and they've messed it up. Uh, this thing that um, you went into the YouTube rabbit hole and consumed all this uh, content marketing and came out more confused on the other side. This thing, digital marketing is something you can master and that you can use for your career and for your business. And, and that self-confidence is, in essence, really what our product is, to give you the belief in yourself. Um, and once you believe in yourself, good things start happening. And that's um, just, it's so funny that you can have an apparel brand or an, uh, a, a co-working space or a school, and we're all selling, in essence, the same thing, uh, which is community and confidence. So, um, you know, with that, uh, I wanted to give uh, the floor uh, back to Adriana to wrap up. Um, if you could just tell us, uh, you know, one, you know, big, big final thought of, of what you've gotten out of these sessions or, or what your biggest takeaway is, uh, Adriana, I would love to uh, hear you uh, share uh, as, we, as we wrap up our 10th session and go into uh, our next decade of sessions. Okay, I mean, we can even uh, talk about what we had today, which is what is the benefit that we are offering to the, to the customers nowadays. I mean, it's different than what we used to offer before the pandemic, which is beforehand people would come by quickly and leave. Nowadays, people want to feel reassured. They come, they want to hear a little bit more about your story. It's not only about the product itself. So this is more or less what in, in a nutshell the whole story is. We try to give the, to the customer not only the product, but the service and the feeling of being uh, someone that is needed at this moment because we need your help. We need the help of everyone to survive. Beautiful. I, I don't think we could have said it better. Thank you for closing out our 10th session and being such a loyal uh, you know, partner with us in this part of our community. I, I hope you come back for the next 10. Thank you so much. A pleasure. So you guys are all going to get an email with links to this presentation uh, and how to contact and learn more about Shana. Uh, you'll also get links to our upcoming sessions about Instagram stories, finding your target audience on Facebook, and wondering where to pivot, start with values. So how to identify your core values, which have been such a big part of what we've talked about today. You know, we're also on the lookout right now for partners, uh, folks that are in touch with other business owners around town to help promote and partner with us on our five week program. So if you are in touch with other businesses that you think could benefit from the confidence to be able to find and generate their own online leads, please be in touch with me. You know how to reach me. And I encourage you all to keep coming and to grow with us. And with that, thank you so much Shana, that was fabulous. Thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday at 1230. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.